it's it's fun to be here, I have to say, um, and it's an interesting topic. Uh, the departments we work in these days are all under going a lot of change, so I think it's a really good a really good choice. Um, I'd actually like to get a little understanding of where you all work right now. Also, um, I'm curious if you work as a writer or if you have a different role within your writing organization. Um, we could just go around or maybe, uh, yeah, we could just maybe just uh, make a comment if you just give me a sense of, do you work as a writer or are you in another role there? Okay, uh, well it, it's clear that, I mean, we've got a tremendous range of experience right here in this room. Um, let me see if I can make this work. So you could say at one point, this was technical writing, right? Or at least writing, sitting around, getting stuff on paper. Uh, they did a study uh, at Apple when I was there, so that would have been in the 90s, and they've done more recent studies. What we're seeing is actually when you boil it down, we only spend about 10% of our time actually writing. We spend a lot of our other time doing other things. Um, <laughs> well, it depends on the individual, but we're hoping for 10%. So if that was where we were with tech, tech pubs, now often we're not even called tech pubs. My particular group is called information experience. Um, a lot of people are looking at content strategy, information, um, engineering, or looking at architecture. I mean, a lot of these buzzwords you will have seen in one form or another. Um, one of the things we have seen, and it's been reflected in the conversation, uh, is that of, of all those W's, the, the questions you're supposed to ask, who, uh, uh, what, where, when, all these are changing. The why is still true. We are still trying to help someone understand how to use a product, but uh, I don't know about all your um, groups, uh, my group. Uh, currently, I manage a, a team of writers. I have one writer in California. I have uh, two in Colorado. I have one in Massachusetts. I have two in Israel and two, soon to be four, in Bangalore. So, you know, meetings, uh, meetings are a pain. It's like seven in the morning or nine o'clock at night. Um, so it's kind of, in fact, I canceled my Monday nights. I always have a meeting with Bangalore, but I took the evening off because I'm here. So that's a nice change. Um, uh, what we do has changed. We've talked of that. Um, so all of these things. Um, what we're, when you stop and think about what is technical communication, what is technical information, what is, what is it that we're talking about? <coughs> Excuse me. It's no longer how does this product work and writing it down. It's kind of like the uh, documentation you get when you buy Word or Excel or something. This command does this, this command does that. What, what they don't tell you and where there's this huge market for third party books is why you'd want to do that in the first place. So. This is the kind of place where we are going with a lot of our documentation now. Or I, We use that word, it's often not documentation, it's often more information. So it used to be that everyone was, uh, you, had, you aspired to be a good writer. Now we make the assumption that people can write. We uh, are able to communicate. <clears throat> oh, there's Waldo. Yeah. Um, so this is this is one of the things about who. So it's not necessarily a writer necessarily that's writing. We are often now pulling in people from other areas. Um, we are pulling in uh, at, at Google, for example. We had a tech writing workshop, and the audience for that were the developers, because typically you'll have. Uh, uh, writing team that is a ratio of like one to ten, one writer, ten developers. So, or whatever, I mean, whatever that. Um, so, if you want to uh, do a better job of coverage, you need to, uh, an advantage would be to get those developers to do some of the writing. Um, communities is another place 
where uh, we really can pull in other, other uh, sources of information. Um, we are also seeing that uh, the information uh, that we are working with, everything's a lot more complicated now. Ah, we're, I'm ahead of myself here. Um, the products that we're working with are sometimes much more complicated. Uh, they often have added new features and new features and new features, so it's now an incredibly complicated product. Uh, the tools we're using are more complex. Used to be you would just go into Word, now it, then it moved to FrameMaker, then Structured FrameMaker, and now we have Dita. We're working in XML. Uh, we have a, a content management system, a repository, where we have all of our um, documentation. For example, at VMware, we have our DITA materials, all the topics there is in a content management system. Uh, we use Publication Manager and the SDL Trisoft to access that material, add access, access and edit it. We use Perforce for our release notes. We use CVS uh, for our landing pages. So we have all these different uh, pieces of software that every writer needs to be comfortable using. Uh, our processes, in order to handle all of these, particularly when you get around DITA, the processes are complex. Um, so VMware is very much looking at how it can adjust to this changing world. So where this comes in is your audience will come to your website looking for information. And if they arrive and they think, I believe I'm going to be able to find my answer here, they will give you the benefit of the doubt, they will stay longer, they will work harder to get that answer. Um, if they arrive and it, it's not a user-friendly interface or it's difficult to use, um, it's not appealing, it, it's an old style, uh, you start to turn people away. Uh, so perception really makes a difference. Um, don't, don't you find that most people come to your documentation through Google? Uh, uh, I have a. <laughs> uh, the answer to that is a is a is a two sided. Um, people, uh, what we do find is uh, everyone, the first. Uh, automatic what they do to try and find an answer is they'll Google it. You know, you just type it into the search, you know, into the location field of the search bar. Um, so that is where they will start their search. Uh, at VMware, at least, we have seen that where they first end up being taken, where they first end up going, is to our knowledge base uh, articles. They do not initially come to our documentation. Um, so this is, these are all pieces of things that that we need to, to work on. Um, uh, one of the points here also is, uh, for example, when I was at Apple, I was in the I was one of the editors there. Well, at, at a certain point within my time at at Apple, and we were uh, I particularly worked I was on the developer side. We I worked on inside Macintosh, um, and we spent a lot of time uh, making them perfect. It was a lot of polishing and. Talking with my manager about this, it's like, why do we spend this much time and energy making them look so great? And her response was all about perception, that, you, that Apple as a brand is very polished and people expect things to look a certain way, um, to be very presentable. So this is a place where perception really makes a difference. Um, at, at VMware right now, we have, this is our old, this is old meaning what we have right now. This is our doc center right now. It's a very old style design and these are all public materials. So it's a very old style design. Um, it's, it, nothing works very hard for you. The table of contents doesn't work very hard. Uh, you can't learn much by looking at it. It's, things are very nested. It, it's, so we are definitely, uh, rethinking this. This is something we're going to start prototype. We're going to start um, testing more thoroughly in June and, and before the end of the year. I think we'll have this for most of our uh, 
material. And I mean, one even minor difference is we have, these are documentation centers and these will be called information centers. Um, so, and in this you can see right here, we've got videos. So we've got the videos, we've got social media coming in. Um, we're going to be, and this is something you see now more, we see it on everywhere, but you will start, be, you'll see it more and more on the doc sites. So, um, and before I leave here, one of the things I wanna uh, comment on also is, uh, you know, the buzzwords. And one of the uh, frequent buzzwords that I hear now is customer experience, sometimes shortened to CX. Everything is around the customer experience. And of course, the customer doesn't, uh, doesn't really have the secret handshake in the sense that uh, if they are trying to figure out uh, how you install this product, they just want an answer. And when they Google it, they see all the things that show up. They don't necessarily think, oh, I want the documentation center. That's the fifth link down, I'm gonna go there. They just start at the top and come down. So their experience uh, doesn't uh, differentiate between where the different sources of the information are. So as I say, uh, VMware is looking quite seriously at how to rethink how we approach docs, not even just how we do them, if you like, but even before we start writing. We have uh, the uh, role of an information architect. Uh, at VMware, we have it in two different flavors. We have uh, a formal information architect role. At the moment, we have one. We're soon to have a second. And our department's uh, around 100 people, just a little bit less than 100 to give you a sense of the size. And that's just the group that's within this information experience team. There are other small writing groups, uh, decentralized, uh, that are not part of this number of 100. Uh, yeah? I'm curious, do you ask your customers? Sorry? Do you ask your customers what they want to see? Because um, you're writing for them, right? And I find my experience is there's the documentation team and a vendor, and then there's a customer. And the two do not talk. Well, uh, uh, another complicated answer. Uh, yes, we try to. Yes, we should do more of it. Um, actually, it's remarkably difficult in our group and in many groups to get a hold of the customers. Uh, the product managers, uh, for example, at VMware, I know we've had discussions because indeed this is, uh, we have various theories about how our docs should be put together. And uh, at the moment, it's just my theory versus Carol's versus Brian's versus whoever. Uh, I feel really good about mine. I have a lot of experience, but we should be talking with customers and then it will be a done deal. Um, but uh, there are a lot of points where VMware talks with customers and they don't want customers to get overwhelmed by different groups at VMware contacting them. So they tend to keep it kind of low key. If a product manager uh, works, and sometimes the UX team uh, works with product management and interacts with the customer, uh, they are very focused on what the customer, what the task is that the customer needs to do. And one of the challenges that we always have is there's some percentage of customers who are not so interested in reading. They are more interested in doing. And so to come to the customer and say, okay, if you had to read about this, what would you want to read? It's, it's a challenge. Um, because they, by and large, don't want to read. Um, so this is this is another aspect of, of what we do. Kind of a long answer, but does that help? Yeah, so why don't you ask instead of what you want to read, what you want to do? And we do, and we do, and we get that from the product management, but that's not, um, that's not getting feedback on our docs or the information that we present. Uh, we do, that is in fact what we, we, we run with that, but, but that closing that feedback loop of like, we think you want to do this task, we think this is the additional information you will need to accomplish that, 
We put that together in whatever form. Okay, did that work for you? That's the piece of the feedback loop that, that we have a hard time getting a handle on. I have a question about budgets. Uh, I've been in situations where the priority um, has to do with the fact that this client is going to spend $25 million on your stuff, and this other company is going to spend $20 million, and then the stuff that's really going to help the $3 million company doesn't get that at all. So do you guys have stuff like that? Right? You know, inevitably. Yeah, inevitably, you know, J.P. Morgan Stanley starts jumping up and down. We tend to pay some more attention. Um, but if you have a good product marketing team, or excuse me, a product management team, they also uh, bring their experience to bear. Um, in previous situations, other other companies, but also if they're talking to the 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 big the big guns. Um, Chances are some of the problems that they run into are problems from everybody. Um, but yeah, I mean, so money does like tend features, to. It's like, do you want to fix this feature for like a little, a few people, or do you want to fix the feature with the $20 million? You know, okay. Right. So, That's always a, a challenge, yes. I, I think um, a lot of those people who want to do rather than read. Are, are looking for like sample code that they can cut and paste and mm -hmm. put into their uh, their own applications. Well, what we're seeing a lot of, I mean, that's on the developer side for sure. Um, what we're seeing on the, uh, my particular product is a, an administration product. Um, it's a, the uh, vRealize Operations Manager is the product that I that I manage. Um, is uh, what, with the, where we're going is with personas. So we have Ethan, who's like a firefighter, and we have James, who uh, is uh, more technical. Um, so we, we uh, have very definite and very clearly defined personas, and we have very clear set of tasks for those people, and then we follow those through in, in our docs. Um, so in fact, given that I'm on this slide, one of the things that our information architects will do is work with us on a taxonomy for our uh, documentation and how we structure topics and how we structure um, a lot of the materials that we work with to support being able to do these use cases. Well, isn't that sort of require a kind of fixed target? Like if an information architect may, uh, may take months to, to analyze and create a taxonomy well, if you have a good information architect, there is some longevity in some of the decisions that they make. And we had actually an excellent guy uh, who knew there's a, a quite a large group of excellent English speakers in uh, Sofia, Bulgaria. Uh, so we have quite a large team of writers there. Uh, and our information architect is based there. Um, and so he's he's done a tremendous job, and his by and large his taxonomy is is holding up. Um, as I said, we have another person coming on board, so we'll keep. And, and it needs to keep evolving. I mean, as you say, things change. Um, we have also a, a second group of information architecture related people. Uh, we call them the the information architect content captain normally referred to as IACC, which is a lot shorter. Um, and we are, um, it's a small group, maybe one or two in each uh, location. So it's quite a small group and they kind of work as a liaison. So if, if my particular team starts to see a, a, a completely new need for a type of documentation or change what we've got, they start working with these content captains and they are very experienced. They start, you know, yes, it's a great idea. No, that's a terrible idea. If it's such a good idea, now we'll take it to the information architect. So they kind of liaise that way. Um, in terms of, so, so this is part of talking about the kind of role you'll have in what's referred to 
the title here, is the modern uh, technical information organization. So typically the large, uh, more modern organizations will have these information architects in some form or another. Another thing they have is video. Uh, that's, uh, several people have said this. Um, VMware made the decision to, and, and several companies have done this also, have made the decision to invest in video. We have a studio that's very um, properly set up. We have a producer and that's his primary role. He produces videos. Um, and we are uh, having people in the department, across the department, do videos. Now last year I came into the team I'm working on about a year and a half ago and uh, someone had said you need to do videos and they were up in arms. I think mostly because they hadn't done videos before. By now they've all done videos so now it's no big deal. What we're seeing now is needing to do short videos like two minutes, four minutes, not lengthy ones. Um, but it is interesting. I've had the experience where I've had developers or PMs say, uh, we don't need you to write up anything about this, we already have a video. So I've seen that experience. Um, <coughs> I've just gone blank on the other one. There's, there's another piece I want to put in here. Um, uh, anyhow, so uh, we, we, uh, we do a lot of video. I think that's, oh, I know what the other part was. I have also had the experience where a writing manager has said, I can't do video, I'm too busy. Well, they're busy writing and they really need to rethink that because we are doing information now, we are not just writing. Um, this having this production uh, setup actually has been really helpful. We've used it for a number of things, not just doing videos for our information, but we do a lot of videos, we interview customers, uh, we've gotten a lot of information from bloggers, uh, so uh, internal and external, we'll do those interviews. Um, so it's, it's been a huge, uh, it's really paid off. Is, is, does that turn in, having a, a professional production uh, facility, is that turned into a bottleneck? Um, I know companies like Salesforce, I've seen their presentations, for example, about how they do this, and they set up these little uh, hokey little things, but they they do produce videos, and they have uh, different departments have their own setups, and they do produce videos, and, and they produce some very nice videos. So, uh, but if you have a front, kind of professional production organization, I'm mean, just wondering if that turns into a bottleneck. It it hasn't been a bottleneck. Um but that could change this year. Our director has said we need to produce twice as many videos this year as we did last year. Um, so that could eventually be a problem. But this guy is very good at scheduling out his time and so we, it, it, we're all behind a little bit in the video so we're still the bottleneck here but that could change. Um, this slide uh, is about another role that is um, growing in popularity is the content strategist. You take stock of what content you have available. Uh, earlier I think I made the comment that a customer uh, doesn't separate out the different kinds of content that's out there. Uh, whether it's from a knowledge base or it's from a pre-sales, uh, technical marketing, uh, something that a field engineer hands them, uh, our technical documentation, uh, you name it. Uh, and for a large organization these days, you need someone who comes in who does an audit of what all you've got, who, who gets these different groups to talk the same language. Uh, you inevitably end up with different names for the same thing. And a customer, as I say, can't distinguish which is the right one. So getting these groups, all these different uh, communication groups around a company to uh, to collaborate, to coordinate is a is an important role. I have a question about that. I, I'm in, I come from a training background. Well, and training's another one. Absolutely. It, it's called the job aid. And so do you and so you have all these instructions that are called job aid. However, if you take the same instructions that a field engineer is going to be using it, it's called a tech or a tech group. And it's the exact 
that full of information. And so then when we part, so how do you organize all of that stuff? Because like I've developed training and back in the day, we would have a document control number so you would be able to say, so it kind of, it may not necessarily matter that it was called a technical or a technical mm -hmm. information was captured mm -hmm. in the demand space and stuff. But there are situations where we, you, I'm looking for work and I have so many key words on my resume because if I'm in biotech, it's the same 20 words when they have potentially even vocabulary. And so I'm trying to talk to everybody. How do you deal with that? Well, you hire somebody who, <laughs> that's all they do. Um, it is a challenge. I mean, I, I thought you were going somewhere different around the training. So uh, if you have a group like at VMware, for example, there's a group that does training and they do training for my product, for example. Now they do, they, they do contact us so that there's some connection between what they're writing and what we're writing. But inevitably, some of what they present in their classes is not the same. Uh, and a customer, again, doesn't know the difference. Uh, here it's called, uh, I don't know. I mean, but just the terminology of how they present things may be different from, okay, they took the class, they get the thing, now they come into our docs uh, and they're lost. Because it's, um, so I think these are all, um, actually, I, I realize also, I don't have a watch. Can someone give me a Okay, so let me, let me get through some more of this. Um, so, go ahead. No so at VMware, what is the relationship like between Thank you. Uh, the information experience department and the instructional, the, the, mm -hmm. the training group. Have you used the same source material? <coughs> well, uh, a year ago, a year and a half ago, when they we had a brand new product, it was a major rewrite. Uh, they simply used, consumed our materials, so they wanted the drafts of all our docs as they created theirs. Um, I don't think they've revised that yet, but they'll probably revise in another six months. So generally, they they do they contact us. Um, so there's a pipeline. Yes, yes. We're not always aware of when they're about to do something, mm -hmm. uh, so it, we really lean on them to come to us. But yeah, there is there is a definite pipeline. Um. Oh, another role. Um, with all of this emphasis on customers, often you may well find it's a useful thing to have a role for what you could call a customer engagement uh, manager, somebody who does social media, all of that stuff. So this would be someone who would work with communities, who would work with bloggers, um, who uh, tracks what's out there on Twitter. One of the challenges we also have with our information that's out there one of the reasons that the knowledge base articles come up at the top is we have not done a very good job of promoting our content uh, from other sites. And that's what uh, pushes up your page rank so that you, you come out higher on. So everyone points to KBs, but uh, not many people actually point to the documentation. So a role for someone who focused on that sort of thing, looking at the social media, doing tweets for, you know, now we have a new document, you know, look at the reference architecture material, all of that kind of stuff will help with this as well. Why does it matter? Like, isn't the idea to have an uninterrupted experience for the user? If they find, if they're using the uh, replication, and they can find what the information they need in there, isn't that the ideal situation? Why would, yes. why would you want the, the traditional dog? Well, at least similar amount. The thing with KBs is they're often not very well written. They typically, they often do not have any kind of context. Uh, they may not be edited, so they can be pretty rough. Uh, and indeed, uh, often, uh, you know, that's fine. Um, but if we are investing time and energy and resources uh, to um, provide a little more context, to uh, to provide a use case, uh, I definitely want customers at least to know that that's there, so that they could get there. At the moment, it's way down on the list; like it'll be like the tenth in a list. Um, so we we just need to get it up 
you know, a little higher. Um, but yeah, if the customer, if that solves the problem, that's great. So you're telling me that the knowledge base articles are written by somebody who's mm -hmm. not a writer? That's a question. That's often the case. Uh, it may be written by our uh, support staff. Okay. The, so they're not edited by a writer or? Mm -hmm. it, it, on, uh, in the ideal world, yes. Okay. Uh, oh, okay. But there's, yeah, I mean, a lot of those come in, they're very, they're very technical. Uh, the editor that works with them may not really follow the implications, um, and the volume may just make it hard to. And, to and they don't have navigation, really. You know, have no, you just drop in. It's like an FAQ. You just yeah. drop in. Yeah. We often have a link to our documentation. You know, in the yes, case. that we should have. And sometimes <laughs> we do. <laughs> not I mean, always. It's just, it's, it, we, I mean, we, we author knowledge base articles, and we also review the articles by our support staff. Um, so, so we try to work with them. I yeah. Mean, so well, we have a yeah. mix. Yeah. We we have been doing a lot of writing of KBs. Um, I'm actually trying to get those moved over to the support staff so that we get that a little more focused. We shall see. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, well, it depends on on every company's can be a little for a little different, but where the industry is going altogether is the UIs are becoming much more intuitive. So we are actually in the process at VMware of moving away from doing tasks, because you you could say you know you you arrive at the at the the page the the browser the whatever that you're looking at and you're like. Figure it out. I mean, because most people who are now, like we work mostly with system admins, when they, the kind of person who's coming into that role, uh, they have experience, either they have a lot of experience with systems like this, so they don't need tasks, or they have a tremendous amount of experience with mobile devices and they grew up on PCs. So again, they have that reflex action of, you know, I'll just click on things until something works. Um, and so our docs, I think, are going to be shifting. So, so we were just talking earlier. We're, I think, we're going to see moving even further away from PDF and printed stuff. Um, ultimately, I think we'll have tooltips and HTML. Um, now, not every company's at that point, and different groups and within a company will vary as well. But, but that's kind of where we're. Plus, I mean, it's kind of those are fun companies to work at. It's just an editorial. So, um, so. Question. So what do, you, what do you see in terms of the evolution of information experience and user experience? I mean, if what you touched on is something that we're, we're, we've been experimenting with, you know, how to actually get the, the help, if you will, into the application and maybe less in the written. Yes, we have. Uh, some of our docs are embedded, so you're in you're in a uh, the product. You click on the help icon, and you're delivered into a particular 
topic. Um, I thought you were going somewhere else with I, that. I, I, yeah, I actually didn't mean to zero in on health, but have, what is the role of an information developer in actually in shaping the actual UI and maybe the workflow of the implementation? Well, it depends on, you know, it, doesn't, it's, it depends on the group. I mean, some groups are really open to it and other groups are like, they, they're not, I mean, it varies. Ideally, the UX team and the writing team, I mean, like right now, we're, we're doing a new UI and we are working closely with the UX team to come up with the text that they will work on. And we sit in on some of their design reviews, so there's that impact as well. Uh, it varies, I think, that. Um, but where I thought you were going, which was a nice segue to my next slide, uh, is uh, the, knowing the customer. And this actually comes back, Lena, to your point around talking with customers. So we have a hard time physically talking with a customer, getting their attention, but we have a, uh, if you like, a, a backdoor way of doing that, which is to come in and look at all the analytics. Mm -hmm. So if, um, if customers are not going to a particular page, you want to think about why, why do we keep writing that? Uh, it's, it's, it's not like we necessarily will just stop, like if you don't have 100 hits, we're killing that page, but it's definitely something we're looking at. Um, this doesn't give us enough specific information. I mean, I can't say we well, in this example, but we definitely are looking at, we, at, we use uh, Google Analytics. Um, we're looking at changing that because there's a lot of information that they don't sh pass on. Um, but being able to figure out just the page hits and whatnot, but you can also go in there and find out where they, like here's this page, where were they before, where do they go next? So you can get a lot of information about how customers use, use all your stuff. Um, We do, we can see, uh, well, we do surveys as well. Um, but uh, in our analytics, you can, you definitely get how long someone stays there. We also can get that on our videos. You can see how long somebody lasted in a video. Like you no, have a five. Like, for your, like you know when they, they log support code. They're sorry? Text when, they, support when the customers log support code with the MWA. Right. And sometimes they will be like, can't go do this. Yes. This doesn't work. So yes. information for that organization. Some, they, they uh, yes, we do, we work with them. It's not as much info as we'd like, but yes. Um, so the analytics, uh, we do survey customers at big events. VMworld is a big product, production that we do. Um, we also get information about their devices. We look at their search terms, so we get a lot of this information. So one of the things that we're seeing uh, is the need to have web developers who can come in and work on our tools and build specific uh, search uh, uh, searches for us, uh, who can actually develop new tools for us. Um, given also that we have a lot of complicated tools, they also can help support those. Um, so this is the kind of skill set that we're seeing uh, with a lot of these uh, web developers who come in uh, and work for us. Um, are they part of your organization? Yes, they are. And, and this is something, it's, it's not exactly clear here, but I, I do have a slide later on about this. We now have our own uh, tools group uh, because if we are beholden to development to help us develop new stuff and support our tools, we're kind of prioritized at the bottom of the barrel. Uh, because you know they have a new f new feature for customers and that's always prioritized much higher so um, if we need to get things done uh, we end up having our own person so here for example is something we did where we developed a product name database that's actually used across the company so it's not just um, within the IX group it's all of VMware so when they have a new product it all goes in here and so we're all using the same products across the company with the same uh, registration marks and trademark and all that, which is, that's a big plus for us. And our legal department loves this. Um, one of the things before I just comment on this is, is uh, we also do have an in-house data warehouse 
uh, so that we are able to do data mining on some of the materials that we have. Um, we can look at uh, some of the topics and the uh, how many topics have been released, how many have, are still in a draft form. We can kind of track some of the uh, activities in the department there. Um, so in a in, in information, technical information organization, you really need to think about the future. You need to look at what the skills are. Oh, I'm, I'm not as familiar with some of these slides. Um, you need to really look at your uh, skill set across the team. Uh, you need to hire and you need to grow people who fill those slots. So it won't just be writers, it'll be people who are good with videos, it'll be people who are good with uh, customers, people who are really good with social media, um, uh, developers, uh, information architects, as you can see, it's an, a, a, quite a range. Um, one of the things that uh, my director, uh, Laura Bellamy, uh, comments on is uh, to continue tracking the ratio of writers to the service group. So we have a service group in our, in our organization, we have uh, editorial, the video person, uh, we uh, have a graphic designer, actually I think we have two graphic designers now, um, which is something I was supposed to mention when we were doing first impressions, that slide, because they make an enormous difference. Uh, when you when something is visually appealing um, so but to keep track of how many uh, writers you have for this service organization so this is just a general comment can you can see this yes um, so before XML of course we wrote somebody edited there was production there were some tools uh, once we started doing XML, we definitely had to add in an information architect and some level of testing. Uh, we now, is basically backing up the sort of thing I was just saying. We have video, we have developers, we have the information architect. Um, I don't think that's exactly the ratios we have. We have more writers. Uh, no, this is the, oh, this is the service, sorry, this is the service staff. Um, so it's it's quite a uh, quite a large group. I think it's about seven people at this point on the services team. So uh, this is this is the slide. I thought the previous one was. So we yes, uh, there's some managers. That is true. Uh, and we have the services group, um, and then we have uh, by large we do have writers, but. A lot of people prefer the term information engineer um, because we really have to think differently about how we approach the information. Uh, this is the kind of the kind of tasks, the kind of roles we're looking at adding. Um, we don't have a content strategist yet. Uh, actually, we don't have a customer engagement person either, but we will get there. Um, so you really have to think about what you want your organization to do. What it what's realistic and what where you want to take it. We uh, had a new director come in about a year and a half ago and it has really transformed our department. I, I was talking earlier with Tom. When I joined VMware about two years ago, I felt like I had like gone to IBM. The, the processes, the slowness with which anything changed, um, I don't know, it was uh, not good. Uh, but I stuck it out. Um, and we have this very dynamic uh, director now who's really interested in innovation, trying new things, who's very responsive to customers, um, and is, uh, really looks around the industry. Uh, so you really have to think about where you want to go and where your department needs to go. And if you're not the person running the department, uh, everything that I've talked about is gaining footing across the industry. So you can be the person in your department who makes some of this happen. You can make a case for any of the roles that I've talked of here and start making that happen even if your department doesn't have it right now. So indeed, you have to start where you are. So that's my, I hope it was helpful.
have a question. Sure. So when you specialize out these roles, and, and you have people you know, who do these dedicated different roles, and you have writers who are doing more writing, do they, do they like having that specialization where maybe writers don't have to play as many hybrid roles because you've got dedicated people in those, those roles? Or does that bore the writers now they're just doing the same thing? Uh, my answer to both of those is yes. It depends on the writer. There are certainly some writers who just want to write and they just want to deepen their product knowledge and they want to become the expert and that's what they want to do. Um, but then there's definitely other people who want to do different things. So one hopes in the organization, and I see some of this happening. If somebody gets like super bored with writing, they start talking to their manager and other people in other teams and start developing that role. So. Uh, you know, you do need to have, uh, I mean, for any department, you know, if, 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 if your company wants to keep you for another five, ten years, they need to keep you interested, too. Uh, and so that's a two-way street. Thank you, Adam. So how does VMware manage um, acquisitions and bring writers that are working on branded products into the fold so that you all speak with one voice, or is that not important? It is important. Uh, it's done in fits and starts. Well, that's not fair. It's done. Um, so, uh, if we, uh, as we acquire a new product, uh, typically the first they will have their own documentation. Uh, sometimes they come with a writer. Sometimes they don't. I've been involved in a number of projects that came in without a writer. So the first thing that needs to happen is we have kind of a, a white paper template and we at least make their docs look kind of like VMware, kind of, sort of. But it's typically like in Word and it's really basic. It doesn't have anything. But it, it, it has the, oh, like I had a, did this go back to the beginning? No. Uh, but the, uh, yes, the, uh, the blue and green VMware colors, it will have that on the banner, et cetera. So, um, but uh, the department, the IX department, it's, a, it's a, a support group. So if a new uh, project comes in and it's really high priority, uh, they make a case to our department for help. And depending on how much the CEO of the company and his uh, lieutenants, where they think this is going to go, they get more or fewer resources. So it's you know they, that's sort of negotiated, but you you know you ask for it and keep your fingers crossed. And what about the writers? If the, if the acquisition did have writers, what happens? To oh, uh, we we bring those into the. Uh, so they're no longer associated with the product that they came in with the first time. The yes, world. they'll come in. I mean, if they become part of the uh, stable of products that we handle in the information experience group, yes, they will start to be assimilated. <laughs> they will learn our guidelines, our processes, data, how we do everything. Yeah. The form. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. <laughs> yes. So. Does VMware have experience of um, assimilating some um, lines of purchase and then leaving some in their own little micropolitan? Yes. Yes. I found, uh, I was looking for uh, support for something I wanted to do with one of my uh, docs, and I wanted the web. Oh, no, actually, it was the other way around. The people on the team wanted the web, and or the internal, and found this other document. I'm like, do ours like theirs? And I'm like, who are these people? It turned out, actually, they were just sort of on the other side of the very floor that I worked on in the building I was in, but they were totally cut off, and they did whatever they liked. And no, we couldn't do it their way. So it, it is a mix. That's like special arrangement, but yes, it does happen. Yeah, but. And then I have another question, which is that, well, I'm actually a vSphere customer, so uh, okay. I, uh, I, I sometimes need something very specific from the documentation, but um, I, uh, I, it's very specialized. And so do your analytics ever kind of miss some of the stuff that is important to, you know, just a, a very, very small subset, but you know, it, it's showing up as, oh, people can't find it. Is it because maybe they're not, they don't care about it or they're not looking for it? Well, you know, you always have that cost benefit thing, you know, the 80-20 rule. Uh, so, first of all, analytics will miss things. Um, 
but you always have to make the decision to put your resources where the largest uh, consumer um, use is going to be. So, yeah, that's... So then you probably need a KB. I don't know if it's a lot of big very frequently because they're not associated with the inheritance, so they have to order. Yes, it's a it's a, so it's a, a flawed, flawed yeah. yeah. Well you can work around it by adding metadata to all the articles as they come in. You can say this oh and this is obviously written on the versions of so and so released mm -hmm. at a certain time. And that really helps because then you know that if if version if the KB is in version three of something, just throwing that around. And Changes in that particular functional didn't happen until version five. It's when you're in version five, then you can say, you know, deprecate it, you know, see this article. So, mm -hmm. say people have bookmarked, but if it comes up, it still comes up high in Google search because it's been referenced so many times. Yeah, they change the UI and then you yes. have a KB article that shows you how to do something, and then you look at your product and you have no idea what you should be doing. Yeah, it's out of date. Yeah, but it's not obvious to, to a user. And sometimes it's not obvious to you as a writer if you're not working in that particular area of the same product. It's yeah. just, it gets so big. Yeah. So, so wrangling that information, going back to one of the points you made earlier, is taking all the information that's out there and making sure that it stays up to date. It's almost an impossible task. It is an impossible task. Yes. For trying to focus on well, there's a couple, I mean, you know, all product, the work, it has ebbs and flows. So when the developers are, are flailing and they're not delivering, uh, or you have a bit of a downtime, that's a chance to come back in and look at some of those KBs. But I also want to drop in another item here, which is another place where the version, the not being up to date is another challenge, is in videos. Mm -hmm. So yeah. video is a screenshot, um, and that is an ongoing, that's something we're getting into right now, is how do we keep videos up to date? Um, and, and we have a YouTube channel, which is also, you can't, you can't really delete anything from YouTube. Um, well, I mean, uh, we don't want to delete it. We just want to say, oh, don't use, like you say, don't use the one for version three, use the one now for version five. What you can do is you can put a line of text on top of a YouTube to say, by the way, this now, there's a newer one. So you, you can do that. There's a few things you can do, but it's, it's not a lot. But videos are another challenge in this arena. Is there some kind of hybrid video you could make that that kind of automatically generated uh, rather than shot with a camera, uh, and so that not that I know of yet. UI changes and get the new huh. version. <laughs> it would be nice. It would be nice. Well, one of the things is to have videos that are really short, you know, like two minutes. Uh, then the the uh, cost to keep that up to date is is a lot less. Um, so, you know, there's things you can kind of come at it in a somewhat different approach. Can you localize that? Like, we are uh, we are just starting to localize videos, but everything in our video world, uh, you write a Camtasia, you, you you write a script, it's in Camtasia, so that script is localizable right there. So. And then do you use we use Chuck. He's very, I mean, he is professional. Because I've used, you, you start to work with a professional, especially if you have a timeline, and he would, I didn't see these complaints for a long time, and he would fax them, and I'd say, oh, based on this, here's how long it's going to take me, and here's how you rate it. And then people would go, we don't want to do that, and they would hire, they would just use the tech writer, and then you would start to see where it was, it, it just took so much longer. Well, you know, the more you do something, the quicker you get at it. So, 
it was pretty painful two years ago, but people now are churning out. You could you could do a two a two minute video in a couple of days, you know, script to production to out the door. I, I would like to share an experience that I had when I first started in Denver Um It was on May 1st, uh, the Beach Summit was, I think, June 9th. It was this much documentation. And I was employed with the team. The most effective method I found of working was to talk to the lead of product and say, can you record for me a video of how you go through a use case with me and doing that? So I picked up from that, I did a presentation from that, and from that on, I started doing uh, videos that are like a conglomeration of related features. And it was really easy to do a draft. You just point and shoot. And then I would use that video uh, essentially as a script to develop documentation from. Because then I won't miss any steps. I have the video on one screen, and I'll be writing and pausing and going back and forth. And once I have that clean script, and I worked out all the things where the errors came in and started working around the errors, because still a new product. Um, I would go in and I would reshoot the video smoother. And I actually didn't have any voice. I, took, I talked through it, but then I deleted the audio because I hate the sound of my own voice. Mm -hmm. And then we did another video that was more marketing, and I had a marketing as a face made for it, you know, and, but beautiful voice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, a lot of those product <laughs> management types, they like to, well, they like their voice to be out there too. Well, not only, you had a deep Yes, no, I, I have I, a high sibling female voice. Your voice is probably just it. fine. Re but record it, record it, it doesn't sound good. I know what There's you mean. Actually, the, the military has found that when that men will pay attention to a woman's voice on audio, like as a voiceover, and so you'll see all these computer systems, like in the plane, and it will be a female <laughs> voice talking. And so the women, if you're trying to listen to it, it doesn't matter if it's or a woman, but um, men respond and they can remember the stuff, so a lot of things are only done with a female voice. Because they were raised by mothers. Oh. <laughs> oh, no, I don't know. Maybe. I'm not sure my wife would agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but thank you for, thank you for the pitch. <laughs> but no, uh, I think it's very easy to do a uh, quick and dirty video and get the project through it. Don't think of video necessarily as this brilliant end product. Think of, think of it as something like a catalyst for your walkthroughs. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. really good idea. I actually um, would like to do a, a, a tape recorder off the video. Mm -hmm. But what I would do is that I re re would record it rather than taking notes and stuff because I want to make certain with the subject matter expert, I want them to feel comfortable. And what I always would find out is that a lot of times I would be sitting at And to get in, whether you can, if you can get a subject matter expert to demonstrate things on your computer because you have the recording software, but it also puts it on there 
just say, oh, all this piece is missing all because of the credentials. Let me download the credentials. And then you capture all the other little tiny things that must be in place that you may not see it if they're running on, on their pre-installed frequently very tiny configuration. Right now, I'll, I'll just say maybe in, in, in closing here that um, I think it's a really interesting time to be in, in the information world. I think uh, the possibilities are pretty much endless. Um, actually, also in general, I think the world is pretty favorable right now if you're contracting. I think there's a lot of jobs out there. Um, is contracting, I, I'm not sure about I don't know the whole world out there, but um, but there's a lot going on. Um, so uh, there's a lot of different areas. It's all worth learning more about, and uh, you can totally make the case to make some of these things happen if it's something you're particularly interested in. Um, so.